slabs. Um, so we're going to cover CAN first and then CAN FD second. Uh, however, I am going to do some demos. So let me go to the next slide here. And this will be the agenda for today. So we'll do an Intrepid Control Systems intro for those of you who don't know uh, much about Intrepid. Uh, then we'll get into a classic CAN bus presentation. And then I'm going to do uh, three different uh, demos for CAN uh, for ve using Vehicle Spy. And I have uh, hardware with me hooked up to my computer, so we'll, we'll show you that. Uh, then we'll, we'll have a CAN FD discussion, and then I got a couple demos for CAN FD using Vehicle Spy, and then we'll wrap it up with questions and answers. And I don't know how many of you already sat through some of our classes. We, we go through this intro. Uh, pretty heavily in the basics class. Um, I've done it uh, in the scripting class and the gateway building class, uh, but just a limited number of slides here. So I think today we'll do the same thing. We'll just go through a few of the slides uh, and not go through the whole presentation. I think uh, I think it could take you know over uh, 40 minutes or so to go through the whole presentation. And I know you guys aren't here to learn about Intrepid, but learn about CAN. And can FD. So who are we? So we were a supplier of automotive networking and data logging tools for 25 years. We're a product focused company and what we mean by that is we don't do the AutoSAR stacks. Our primary focus is hardware so we sell a lot of the you know value can series, fire series, fire 2, uh, Neovi Ion and um, with all of our hardware products, uh, every one of those interface with our vehicle spy software. So that's the one software product that we do sell. Uh, we do have a couple other products. I'll touch base on that as well, but mainly we're a, a hardware pro product focused company. We're a private company and virtually debt free. We just did move into a brand new building at 15 Mile and Stevenson Highway. So we're excited about that. Uh, we sold our old building and production is in process right now of getting up and running in the new building. Everybody else has moved over prior to production moving over, so we hope to be up and running in a week or so. We also have a new dedicated room for a training class at the new building, so we'll be teaching in that class once, we, once everybody gets back to work and we start doing more uh, hands-on training at our facility. I also want to point out that we're a global company, so we have a headquarters here in Troy, Michigan, but we have a West Coast office, um, and then we have offices in Germany, the United Kingdom, India, uh, Japan, Korea, China. We have three offices in China, Beijing, Shenzhen, and uh, Shanghai, and um, our UK office is a year and a half old, two years old, uh, and it's really growing, so it's doing well. So that's our global footprint. We have some uh, some partners, distributors uh, placed around the world as well, uh, so they can help you out in those regions. Uh, so we're a global support team. Uh, so when you call support, uh, there's somebody available 24-7. Uh, the main support, though, is here at headquarters. Uh, but um, somebody will answer the phone uh, I think 24 hours a day now we have uh, we have somebody in Japan that will uh, can speak both uh, Japanese and and uh, English uh, we invest in new technology so we were one of the first companies to come out with automotive Ethernet uh, tools can FD tools and, and cybersecurity Global customers, so not only uh, automotive OEMs, automotive tier ones, uh, heavy duty off-road farming equipment, uh, Harley Davidson motorcycles, uh, other other motorcycles as well. I think uh, so. You can see this. This is just some of our customers, but uh, mainly everybody in the automotive space. Uh, automotive space we we talk to. Uh, we've sold 20,000 copies of Vehicle Spy worldwide. Uh, we have been profitable every year since uh, 1994, uh, average 25% growth rate in the past 10 years. And then from a hardware standpoint, you can see we've sold over 20,000 uh, Neovi Fires, 3,000 Fire 2s, 50,000 Value Can Series, 
and 3,000 uh, wireless data loggers. Because we are a tools company, we conform to uh, these specifications. We, we also participate on these committees. We uh, speak at these committees. We write uh, white papers, uh, but mainly we do have to conform to the uh, spec and uh, interoperability uh, for our tools. And then this slide is just uh, showing kind of a, a product uh, versatility. Um, so we have vehicle network interfaces. Uh, those connect directly to vehicle spy to your laptop or computer and interface with vehicle spy. I'm going to go counterclockwise. Uh, so we we have standalone data logging support as well, and then we have wireless uh, data logging along with standalone data logging support. Uh, automotive Ethernet switches are, are new for us, so we got two new products there. Uh, what's not shown in here, well, I guess in the vehicle network interfaces, a couple of those uh, green color, uh, yellowish green color products are the Rad Moon series, Rad Supermoon. So we've done a lot already with uh, automotive Ethernet uh, media converters, active taps, 100 base T1, 1000 base T1, and so forth. And then the Rad IO2 series at the bottom there is brand new product for us. Thermocouple, analog input, uh, relay output, digital input output. So a bunch of diff different devices there. Uh, they communicate on the CAN bus or they can communicate directly to the Fire 2 or the ION via USB. Then we jump over to the gateway and node simulator. So we have Neo ECU 10 and 12 and uh, Dash 20. So these are low cost uh, uh, ECU nodes that you can program with CAN messages or LIN messages to simulate a, a node that uh, maybe you're missing on the bench and you need to com complete the network. We have calibration tools that can access memory directly. And then we have some accessories there like a vivid CAN touch display, which uh, communicates on the CAN bus. You can transmit on the CAN bus, you can receive messages, you can display in graphical format. You can have multiple screens. It's a touch screen, so you can swipe to different uh, graphical panels. We also have a uh, mic uh, button right there. So if you're data logging in the vehicle and you want to have a trigger, you can press the button. It will trigger the data logging. Uh, you can also talk into it. It will record your voice for 30 seconds and that voice will be recorded in the data log file as well. We have different types of cameras, uh, Axis cameras, P-series and F-series. Those are on our website. And then finally there, the big, big data is when you are doing wireless uh, data logging and you want to upload the data to the server, it could be your server, it could be our server, but we have a, a software up there called DataSpy that lets you look at the data uh, and you can graph it, you can share it with your colleagues anywhere around the world. You can annotate on the graph, they can see what you're annotating, they can annotate back. Uh, so that is a, a, a software package that we also sell along with Vehicle Spy. And then education, we wrote the book on automotive ethernet and, and we do a lot of these classes. So because of the coronavirus, we're doing a lot of online classes right now. And we've had to modify the classes so that we can run simulation because we know not everybody has hardware. Uh, when you do come to Intrepid though and take our class, we try to use hardware when we can. Uh, when we teach vehicles by basics, we really don't need hardware, so we use simulation files. And same with scripting, uh, we can use simulation files. But when we get into data logging, obviously you need a you need a device that can data log. So uh, We'll do that with hardware, our gateway builder, we can do with hardware. Uh, ISO 14, 229 diagnostics, we do with hardware. Ethernet, we do with hardware. So most of the classes do use hardware, uh, but some of the classes we can do with simulate. And then this is uh, what we're gonna talk about a little bit today is Vehicle Spy. Uh, so it's a software package for network analysis, simulation, uh, data logger setup. So you can data log to your computer or you can have standalone data logging depending on the hardware that you uh, use. It can do some automated QA testing 
And you can see in the image there, we support uh, video camera input, uh, graphical panels, uh, graphing, uh, signal plotting, uh, of course, the message view for CAN, LIN, Ethernet, and so forth. And then these are the protocols that we support. So you can see LIN, CAN, CANFD, Ethernet, Broad R Reach, which is automotive Ethernet, and uh, FlexRay. And then, uh, so these are some of the products. Value CAN 4 Series, uh, Rad Moon Series is automotive Ethernet. Rad Star 2 is automotive Ethernet, but also has a couple CAN channels. Uh, FlexRay device. The NeoVi uh, Fire 2 is, you know, one of our best sellers. That's what I'm going to use today when I do my demo. I got two Fire 2s hooked up back to back. It has eight, can, eight channels of CAN, CAN FD, and four channels of LIN, and one Ethernet. So it's pretty versatile. The Rad Galaxy is a combination of automotive Ethernet and CAN. So it has 12 uh, Ethernet channels, automotive Ethernet channels, and eight CAN or CAN FD channels. We'll move over to the ION. It's uh, like a Fire 2, but can double the amount of CAN channels and LIN channels and is, has wireless capability, Wi Fi, or cellular. Uh, and then the plasma is discontinued. So. So that's it for the automotive, uh, the ICS intro. I just wanted to go through uh, that. Okay, let's talk about classic CAN bus. So key features, speed up to one megabit per second, but in practice, we really see 500 kilobits per second for the high speed CAN. You know, we see 250 kilobits per second, 125 kilobits per second for lower speeds non-destructive message arbitration. And what we mean by that is when a two nodes are trying to transmit on the bus at the same time, uh, and, and other type of network topologies, the message could be destroyed. But with CAN, the message is not destroyed. So there's an arbitration that goes on for every single bit. And we're gonna go through a demo on that. And so if you lose arbitration, your node has to back off. And then the node that does win arbitration will continue to transmit on the bus. Therefore, the message is not destroyed and will continue to go out. Since all the nodes are on the bus, all ECUs receive all messages. Now, that doesn't mean they have to do anything with the data, but they will at least receive the message. And then if it's a valid CRC, meaning there's no errors in the message, they will acknowledge the, me the message is valid. And then finally, there's no guaranteed message latency, and that's because of bullet point number two up there. So if you want to transmit every 10 milliseconds on the nodes, and there are other nodes on the bus transmitting, and then you have a ARB ID that's a relatively high number, you might lose arbitration. So then you have to back off and then wait for the bus to be empty and then go ahead and transmit again. So now your 10 milliseconds might become 10.2 or 10.5 or 11 milliseconds. So then that's what we mean by no guaranteed message latency. Uh, there could be slight delays depending on the, uh, the, the bus traffic, you know, and are you at running at 10% or are you running at 80%? So if there's 80%, you will see more latency in the messages going out. Uh, dual wire CAN physical layer. So it's two wires, twisted pair, CAN high and CAN low, plus a common ground. Um, there are two 120 ohm termination resistors at each end of the network. So that will give you a balance of 60 ohms impedance on the network. And in practice, termination is relatively flexible and not required. So you could have a 120 ohm resistor on the bus on one end and not the other one, and it will probably work fine depending on, depending on the uh, network itself, how many ECUs are on the network. Um, do you have any ground offsets? Do you have noise in the system? Uh, if, you're, if you're pretty clean, then one resistor would work, and it doesn't even have to be 120 ohms. You could put a 60 ohm or 100 ohm. Uh, so in practice, it's pretty flexible, 
but you do need some type of termination on the network. When you get to CAN-FD, it does become more important because instead of 500 kilobits per second, we're going to transmit all the way up to 8 megabits per second. So you do need that termination resistors on each end. So here's a uh, topology, uh, one example. So here's a CAN bus with three nodes, and there's uh, the 220 ohm resistors at each end. And you can see each node has CAN high and CAN low coming into it. And then I threw a ground in there to show that, uh, you know, it's you should really have a common ground between all the nodes. What I found too, going to customers and troubleshooting, is sometimes they'll have nodes one and two might be separated quite a bit, and uh, they have the two wire twisted pair going to to the two nodes one and two, but the grounds are not common. And sometimes they'll have can errors or, 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 or you know, they have uh, just some, some communication errors and so forth. So it's always a good idea to uh, commonize the ground and tie your grounds together. And then, you know, using, here's an example, using our value can four, we can tap onto the network and bring that data back into the computer through Vehicle Spy. So we can monitor what's on the network or we can even transmit back onto the network. This is a, a second uh, topology. I didn't draw the grounds in here, so they're implied here, but uh, we have two different CAN buses. So each CAN bus has its 100, 220 ohm resistors terminated at each end. In this case, three nodes on each CAN bus, CAN high, CAN low. And then you can see uh, a lot of designs now have a gateway module. So before these CAN buses would just go out to the OBD connector in your vehicle, and now they're putting a, what they call a central gateway module there, uh, which will help prevent against uh, attacks from outsiders coming in, into the vehicle and hooking up to the OBD port and, and putting messages on the bus. So now you have to have the right security protocol to get, to get through the gateway but also the gateway manages the traffic between the two different buses. So in the old days, there was you know one or two buses in a vehicle, and now we're seeing five, six buses in a vehicle, even more. So what does a CAN signal look like? Well, it's a differential signal. So when there's no traffic on the bus, it's sitting both CAN high and CAN low are sitting idle at 2.5 volts. And then when a signal comes in, we get a differential. So the CAN high will go to a voltage above 3.75 volts, and CAN low will go to a voltage below 1.25 volts. Every, uh, every ECU on the bus will have a CAN transceiver on it. And what that does, it converts the, the differential signal into a logical signal uh, on the TXD and RXD lines that go back to the microcontroller. And this is either 0 to 5 volts or 0 to 3.3 volts, depending on your system voltage. Uh, but it's a uh, just a logical waveform, 0 to 1. And notice that we call a dominant bit uh, is, the is the differential signal. And when we're idle, we call that a recessive bit. So when we're trying to uh, do arbitration on the bus, you can see that a dominant is gonna win over a recessive bit. So the dominant really controls the voltage on the bus. And then with that ECU, you can see on the lower right-hand corner is the CAN transceiver. So there's the CAN high and CAN low connections. And then the TXD and RXD will go back to the microcontroller. So with CAN, you need a microcontroller that has a CAN uh, peripheral on it. And so with LIN, you don't need that. You just need to tie to the UART. But with CAN, you have to pick a microcontroller with the CAN controller on it. So this is just an example on how it hooks up. Uh, I used to work at Microchip as an FAE, so my buddy supplied me the next couple slides here. So when you are choosing, and this is more for probably the Tier 1s, not the uh, OEMs, when you are choosing a microcontroller, uh, make sure it has the CAN FD peripheral on it. Okay, so that's right there. Otherwise, you'll design your system and find out you don't have a CAN 
controller on it and you won't be able to uh, talk to the uh, transceiver. So just keep that in mind. Also, um, you know, let me just, yeah. So on the next slide then is the transceiver. And what you need to know here, there are different transceiver, transceivers come in different packages, eight pin, 14 pin, maybe even 20 pin. Uh, you can have single uh, CAN transceiver in one package. You can have a dual CAN transceiver in a package. I think they even have quads now. Uh, but one thing to note is you're looking for AEC Q100 grade zero, which means it's automotive qualified. So it's been tested and, uh, you know, for under stringent automotive uh, environments. And then the OEMs have a list of transceivers that are approved at, at that OEM. So make sure you get with uh, the engineers and the buyers and make sure you get that updated list. So you can pick a transceiver from, from Microchip, which bought Atmel, TI, NXP. They all make these transceivers. Uh, just make sure that you pick the one that is on the list. Okay, and then from an Intrepid uh, standpoint, you know, what, what products do we have that support CAN? So the Value CAN 3 is obsoleted. Uh, so it's been replaced by the Value CAN 4. And note that all of the devices that, that have an asterisk have CAN FD support. So of course the Value CAN 3 does not. It was designed, I don't know, probably 10, 15 years ago. Um, so we now officially obsoleted that product. So we have the Value CAN 4 series, but when we did come out with the Value CAN 4 series, we give you more options. So we have a 4-1, a 4-2, a 4-2EL that has two channels CAN, one LIN, one Ethernet, and a 4-4, which has four channels of CAN. And then everything here uh, that's CAN FD is also backwards compatible to uh, CAN, CAN 2.0B. Uh, the Fire has been replaced by the Fire 2, and you can see the Fire does not have CAN FD support. Uh, the Fire 2 has it, the Ion has it, and now we've obsoleted the Plasma this year as well. So the Value Camp 3 and the Plasma are, are no longer uh, are, are allowed to purchase it from uh, uh, Intrepid. And the Radstar 2 has automotive Ethernet, so does Rad Galaxy, but they also have CAN channels on them and they have CAN FD support. All of our new products going for, forward will have CAN FD support. The one product that doesn't have it right now is the vivid can that's our touch display it has one can channel uh, so that was designed a while back but now we are in the next revision of that product will have can fd support and then one final note here is all of these products interface with vehicle spy software so once you learn how to use vehicle spy software you can use it with any of these uh, hardware products you don't have to relearn another software program for a different piece of hardware. And then when you do purchase the hardware and software from Intrepid, like I said, we offer free classes at our building or online, and we teach you how to do vehicle spy basics. We teach you how to do scripting, um, data logging, ISO 14229 diagnostics, ethernet, uh, LIN, gateway builder, and there's probably one more I'm missing. So, okay, let's talk about the CAN frame itself. So the CAN data frame is serial data. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros going out on the bus and sequenced, okay? And then each, each series of, of data bytes and bits are called frames. So a typical CAN frame is called a data frame and it holds up to eight bytes of data. Now it doesn't have to be eight bytes, it can be zero bytes, it can be one byte, two bytes, all the way up to eight bytes. And then uh, we have what we call the protocol overhead before the data bytes, and then a protocol overhead after the data bytes. So if you have a scope, this is what it would look like. Uh, you have a standard CAN frame. This is an 11-bit identifier, and we're going to talk about the difference between 11-bit and a 29-bit identifier. But you have your header, which includes the identifier and some control bits and bytes or bits. And then you have your eight data bytes, and then you have the footer. And if you have a nice scope, 
it will actually break down the, uh, me the message for the frame for you. So it will decode what the ID is, what the DLC is, what, what the bytes are, uh, what's the CRC, you know, so that not all scopes do that, but the, the nicer scopes do this. So the arbitration field represents the frame ID. That's the 11 bit identifier. The control field defines the frame length. So it's gonna tell you, do you have one byte or two bytes or three bytes or eight bytes in the data field? The CRC stands for cyclic redundancy check. This is how it does error checking. So it's gonna calculate the CRC on the fly. And then this is on the transmitting node. It will insert the CRC, you can see after the data bytes. And then when another node does the same CRC calculation, and it acknowledges that the data bytes, uh, data bits are correct, it will acknowledge. So if there is no acknowledgement on the bus, the, the node will try to retransmit, uh, waiting for someone on the, on the bus to acknowledge. So the arbitration field is 11 bits, and then it's also followed by an RTR bit, which is called the remote transmit request. It says largely unused in my 25 year career here, uh, not here, but in, in automotive. I've never seen the RTR bit used. So I don't know if you guys use it or not, but what it is, it allows you to uh, request data from another node uh, without putting out any data bytes. But like I said, I've never seen it used. And then let's go through the arbitration. So in this example here, you're gonna have three nodes and we're gonna call them node A, B, and C. And the uh, node A is going to try to transmit out a 2A0, B is going to try to transmit out a 5A0, and node C is going to transmit a 220. This is all going to happen at the exact same time. Remember, an, a 0 is dominant, and it will override a 1, which is recessive. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next video, next page here. Yeah, so what you're going to see here before I start the video is so if you know binary the node a is going to transmit a 010 1010 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. b is going to do a uh, 1 uh, 101 1010 0, 0, 0, and so forth so then when uh, node well let's just play the video and you'll see what happens so we start out with no bus activity and now all three nodes transmit at the same time. And you can see right off the bat, node B uh, put out a one, but the zero dominant bit uh, overrode that one. And all these nodes, when they're transmitting, they're reading the bus back. So now node B became a listen only mode. He lost arbitration on the first bit. Then the next bit was sent out by A and C, and they both happen to be one, which is recessive, so a one will stay on the bus. Third bit, they both transmit a zero, so a zero and a zero is a zero. And then on the next bit, you can see C puts out the zero, node A puts out a one. So now uh, node A lost arbitration, because they saw that it put out a one, but read back a zero. It has to go into a listen only mode. And now node C has one arbitration and he will continue to put out the bytes or the bits until the final one is put out on the bus. And then he knows he won arbitration. So now he will continue with the rest of the CAN message. So this is how arbitration works. And you can see node A there only put out four bits, node B put out one bit, and node C is gonna put out the 11 bits.